Now, Newton's third law says when he pushes on him, he pushes on him, and he pushes on him. So the forces should be what? Equal, right? Okay, so let's throw down. Ready? Three, two, one, push. Okay? So, pretty obvious. He went off with a smaller velocity. He went off with a bigger velocity. Now, come back together really quickly. If, now, this is a pretty, pretty obvious thing. If you're going to shoot a bullet and you want the bullet to go really, really, really fast, what is kind of the key? Well, the mass of the gun or the cannon better be significantly higher than that of the bullet. If you have equal mass on the gun and the bullet and you want the bullet to go 1,000 meters per second, well, the gun's going to come off going what? 1,000 meters per second, if they're equal mass. Okay? I.e., really quickly, Wyoming terms, if you don't want the gun to pound into your shoulder, and recoil really, really big, what's the number one thing you can do? Okay, make a really heavy, heavy, massive gun. Okay, which stinks to carry around, but then it doesn't hit you in the shoulder quite as hard. Does this make sense? This, this guy has a mass of 75 kilograms, and we know afterwards he's going to be going back one meter per second. This guy is a mass of 30 kilograms, and what we're going to try to do is find the velocity of that person. Now, in this, I should have done a gun example probably, but guys, this is the classic way that we used to figure out how fast bullets would go. It's, when you shoot a rifle, you can measure the velocity of it going backwards because you can actually see the rifle moving backwards and you can measure that. So you could measure this velocity and from those things, we could then calculate how fast the bullet was going. Does that kind of make sense? Or how fast the cannonball was going. So if we look at this example, we say, the momentum before the collision equals the momentum after. Okay? So in this case, what's the momentum before? Well, we talked about that. Both the guys were going <coughs> zero. So the total momentum before the collision is zero, right? After the collision, the one of them's going to have mass and velocity, the other one's going to have mass and velocity. So we plugged in 75 times negative one. And then plus, after the collision, we got 30. We're looking for the unknown velocity. We solve for that. We come up with a velocity of 2.5 meters per second. Does it make sense that that would be the right answer? Well, let's think about it. Is this guy more massive or less massive? Less massive. So you saw in the example, the less massive guy came out going faster, didn't he? Okay. In this case, he's coming out 2.5. This guy was negative 1. But if we look, guys, this is negative momentum. This guy's going to have positive momentum. You add them together, the momentum after the collision is going to be zero. Momentum before equals momentum after. Does that make sense? Classic way of figuring out how fast a bullet was going before we had chronographs. Okay. All right. Now, if we could, let's step over to this other classic example. And this is going to be a collision where this is a truly inelastic collision where the ball comes in and they stick together. You guys, on almost every physics test you'll ever take at the, at the college level, there's going to be a train car coming in and sticking with another train car, and they're going to move off. Does this kind of make sense? Okay. So can I get one more um, volunteer? Uh, this person has to three, two, one. There we go. We got some right there. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Now, guys, if, if the ball was coming in faster, then he would have moved off, they would have moved off a little bit faster. But the idea is, you guys are pretty smart, if you throw more mass into the system and you have the same amount of momentum, then the velocity has to go what? It has to go down, right? Okay, so let's look real quick. And this is pretty important, sometimes kids, kids get confused with this one. Momentum before the collision, we have the mass of the ball times the velocity of the ball. The mass of the person times the velocity of the person. Now, before the collision, the person was going, was sitting there going zero, right? So what happens to that whole term? Goes to zero. So the momentum before really is the only momentum before is the momentum of the what? The ball, right? Okay. Now, afterwards, and this is the hard part for some kids. Afterwards, because the masses stick together, we have to actually add them together into one new mass. So we take the mass of the ball plus the mass of the person times 
their new velocity, and that's going to be equal to the momentum after. Does that make sense to everybody? Since they're stuck together, we're going to have to treat them as one mass, and then they have one velocity. Okay. So if we look at that, we go uh, mass of 7 times 10, which gives us 70 kilogram meters per second of momentum before the collision. And then after the collision, we got the mass of the ball plus the mass of the person times the new velocity that we don't know. So we get 77 times that, we divide over, and we get a new velocity of the ball and the person of 0.9, what, 0.91 meters per second. Which if we check to see if it makes sure, may make sense, the ball is coming in at 10 meters per second. When they stuck together, they went off at something that was less than one. Okay? Now you guys are really pretty smart. If the ball mass and the person's mass keeps getting closer and closer together when you throw it at them, are they going to move off at, well, increasing amounts of velocity? And if the person keeps getting bigger and the ball isn't getting any bigger, then they're going to move. Well, you saw the very first time I threw it, he barely moved at all. What do you think? Can you guys handle those? Okay. These two examples are kind of really, really classic examples of impulse momentum. To finish off here, guys, and this one's kind of important. This one is obvious, I think, to everybody, but this one you can use when you play dodgeball the next time. Okay? It says, which delivers a bigger impulse? A dodgeball that hits you in the face and bounces off in what, what would be more like an elastic collision, or a dodgeball that hits you in the face and sticks. Okay? So, for instance, I, and you guys have all played dodgeball. Back when I was a kid, you didn't have the nice squishy soft balls. You had those big red ones with like a, the tra traction on them. So like if you got hit the rest of the day, everybody knew it because you had that imprint on your face, right? And so you'd swing back and you'd throw that thing. And if you guys had to guess, which one's going to deliver a bigger impulse to your face? The one that hits and sticks or the one that hits and bounces off? Okay. Well, and... You guys are probably looking up here. The one that delivers the bigger change in momentum, right? That ball's coming in. It has momentum. If it hits your face and then bounces off, it had a pretty big change in momentum because it had positive momentum. Now it has negative momentum. That's a big change. If it hits and sticks, that's all it did was lose its initial momentum. It didn't bounce back off, okay? So let's check this out really quickly. Before... Uh, that's an awesome face right there coming in. Afterwards, it's hit his face. Notice it's flatter and it's coming back out. So I drew all that by myself. Um, the momentum before, it had positive momentum. Coming out, it's got negative momentum. So the change in momentum is equal to the final minus the initial. So we get negative 20 minus 20. We actually get a negative 40 kilogram meters per second um, change in momentum, which is also equal to the impulse. So when the ball hit the face and bounced back, there was an impulse that was 40 kilogram meters per second in magnitude and in a negative direction. Now if it hits and sticks, so before it's coming in, it's got momentum of 20 kilogram meters per second. After, oh, I forgot the I. It sticks on the face right there. Then the change in momentum, okay, the ball afterwards, had zero kilograms, so the change is only negative 20 kilogram meters per second. Okay. So, what kind of dodgeballs do you want to play with if you want to inflict the most pain? Ones that will bounce back off of the face. Okay. Ones that just stick to the face, not so good. That's why when you play with a Nerf dodgeball, and the Nerf dodgeball hits and it like squishes, it sticks to the face, it doesn't hurt nearly as much as when you play with the big old red ball that goes in and hits and bounces back off the face. Okay? To give you a more practical example of this that I think everybody can um, really relate to, there are really, really big raindrops out there that are, that are massive that come down and hit your car. They don't ever dent your car because when they hit your car, they, they flex and that a lot of that energy gets absorbed and they basically hit your car and stick. Okay? Hailstones of equal mass 
will come down and they will dent your car because why? 